welcome uh, to the second part of the conversation that we started last week, uh, COVID-19, the HR response. And I'm delighted that all of you who've made the time this afternoon to be able to come in on board. Uh, we have a very stellar panel here, and I'm going to introduce them in just a bit. Um, here's the, uh, some housekeeping announcements, just so that we have a great experience with the webinar here today. Um, all your mics and your uh, videos uh, need to be off. Um, we will, once the conversation starts, uh, the, the host of the meeting, the administrator will have everything switched off, but we want to make sure there is no noise coming into the webinar that spoils your uh, experience of learning this afternoon. So I'm going to ask you to proactively do this, else the um, host will do it in some time. Um, this is in the interest of being able to make sure that there is no interruption to the conversation we're having here today. Now, we do want your interactions, so please keep going with the chat box on your right. So you have chat written at the bottom of your screen, activate that, so that you have a box on your right where you can continuously communicate, not just with part the panelists, but also with uh, your co-participants um, at the uh, webinar. What we're inviting here today is both questions and comments. So uh, there's, there's a sign saying Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Please use that to be able to post your questions. I'm the moderator for the day, and my name is Dr. Sujaya Banerjee. I'm the founder of the Learning and OD Roundtable. I will be handling your questions as you post them under Q&A. We'll also periodically pick some threads from the chat. So keep the chat as vibrant as you can. Uh, we will have a running time of about 40 minutes on our conversation here with this very learned and very erudite panel. Uh, as we bring in um, questions, we will bring in whoever asked the question also in the central screen where you can share space and we will have your video and your mic switched on so that you can directly ask your question uh, to whichever panelist you want to direct your question. So we do want interaction and I know that we cannot have a vibrant conversation unless you bring all of you in. So we'll get started with a few questions and then I'm very excited to be able to, uh, you know, call you in individually to be able to interact directly with this very outstanding panel. So uh, with that, um, everyone, one more time, welcome uh, to this webinar brought to you by the Learning and OD Roundtable. I have two announcements to make before we get down to the uh, main crux of uh, the crisis that we're talking about today. Um, one is that the Learning and OD Roundtable have uh, put up, uh, put together a very outstanding HR response team. This is a pro bono service offered by expert um, uh, consultants and expert uh, practitioners who are available to you should you have d any dilemma or a query, just want another perspective or a point of view, uh, please feel free to be able to reach out to us um, yeah, through, the, um, through the documents uh, segment of this webinar. We've already emailed uh, stuff to you around the HR response team. So please use those services should you want an alternate learned and informed perspective. So the HR response team. The second and more important announcement I want to make here today is that the Learning and OD Roundtable has partnered with uh, KPMG uh, for a very outstanding HR practices survey. I recommend strongly that all of you participate. Tomorrow's the last day for this very outstanding survey that is does not take more than 20 minutes to half an hour to be able to fill out. Please use the link that's been sent to all of you to be able to participate in this survey. And I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm uh, sure you will all receive um, in return, uh, a best practices survey report from 150 organizations. I mean, this has been a very unprecedented, very incredible time. So I'm sure you're, you're, you're waiting to learn from the practices of other organizations on how they handle various aspects of managing their people during this crisis. Um, so KPMG's uh, survey is, uh, has been, the link's been sent to you. Please participate and, uh, and help us put this survey report together, which I'm sure the KPMG team will be happy to be able to return to you. Um, so with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, it's part two of uh, uh, COVID-19, the HR response. I think we don't have, none of us have any doubts in our mind. We're almost in the fourth week of the lockdown. And undoubtedly, this has been unprecedented, incredible, um, this pandemic, I think even as we spoke about disaster management or we spoke about emergency responses in our own organizations, I'm quite sure we had not considered a global pandemic. Most organizations had not. Invariably, a lot of organizations on a back foot with what ensued, um, despite uh, having knowledge of this pandemic since the December of last year, 
um, somewhere, you know, we have, we are diehard optimists and imagine that it's not going to really come in to impact us. And I think a lot of us, uh, you know, sort of surprised, um, you know, with the lockdown, with the decision of uh, the government asking everyone to work from home. And I think what has ensued has been a time of, uh, that's been very demanding, full of fear, full of anxiety, uh, because of various reasons. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. This has disrupted the lives of millions of people all across the world, infected many people from across the world, disrupted businesses and economies all around the world. These are very, very, very incredible times. You know, I teach leadership and when I speak to audiences and I spoke to audiences in the past and we spoke about being in a turbulent business environment or we spoke about WUKA times, you still have some people scratch their head to say, what exactly is so WUKA about my life? I mean, I work for the same organization. I come to the same building. I come to the same office. I see the same boss. I see the same co-workers. And I think particularly for those who've been in tenured jobs, uh, there's always been a bit of wonder with what really is so unprecedented. And, you know, I mean, sure, we may have seen businesses, you know, fluctuate in terms of their uh, fortunes, but, you know, what is so unprecedented and what is so volatile and uncertain and ambiguous? I think what's, what, after what's happened right now in the last three months, four months, if you want to call it that, I'm not sure anyone's going to ever be confused about what WUKA really means. I mean, this has impacted every single living person's life at this point. Uh, so I want to be able to, at this stage, uh, draw your attention uh, as, as panelists to the very first question that I have. Uh, and I'm going to try and direct this to the uh, practitioners first, and which is not to say that the other veterans we have in this group are not practitioners. They're consultants and they help practitioners very much to perform. But I'm going to try and ask, uh, this is this question is directed to Raju, to, um, you know, uh, to Milind, uh, to Rajesh. Um, so I don't know who wants to go first out of the three of you. I want to be able to ask you, um, you know, we talk about emergency response systems. We talk about business continuity planning. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, crisis management teams. What is your own sense on how much of all this has really worked out? Because it looks like uh, most of it is part of what you need to be able to provide to boards to keep them happy that you have a long-term perspective of risk. Um, I think a lot of organizations were scampering around, struggling on their various fronts, did not know how to roll back, did not know how to mobilize their resources, did not know how to get people functional back for days on end. So I want to be able to get your own perspective on how well prepared, and I, I don't mean only from the people perspective, I'm asking a more, more broad-ended uh, sort of question around how well were businesses prepared in your, in your, um, in your estimate in terms of uh, you know, emergency response, uh, crisis response. Um, I'll talk about crisis communication later. I just want to know how well prepared were we to be able to manage a risk of this kind? So, uh, so Jai, can I go in first? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, basically, since we are in the uh, pharmaceutical business uh, with a very long, uh, you know, uh, value chain, a lot of our things, we also keep monitoring what's really happening. And uh, service to patients and caring for life is really the primary goal and motto of CIPLA as a company. And it has not now, it's been there for many, many decades. Uh, in terms of business continuity, uh, given the supply chain and, you know, one thing which is very clearly emerging in this is the large interdependencies that businesses have uh, amongst each other and globally. So the thing is, I, I would say that our leadership was sensing this, uh, even when this thing was happening in China, um, since a lot of our APIs are, you know, we do have dependencies there as well. So we were monitoring and you know, closely uh, doing the situation because for us, it is very important to have the inventory build up for the required materials. Um, so we, I would say we were reasonably prepared from a business standpoint in terms of uh, dealing with this, uh, you know, and we were better equipped to handle uh, this situation so that there are no shortages of the life-saving medicines that patients depend on us for. The other most important thing, uh, and I think you alluded to it in your conversation earlier, is about preparedness of people to switch over. It was almost like an overnight switch. So while a lot of companies were still contemplating whether to announce work from home, we took the lead and we said, let us start working from home. At least we will provide social distancing. And uh, even before the sanitization measures were actually introduced, 
uh, almost somewhere uh, end Jan or early Feb, we had started, you know, using hand sanitizers, providing all of that. I must say our IT team really rose to the occasion very fast. So we announced our work from home from 17th March onwards. And in a matter of, uh, so they spent the previous weekend, you know, preparing and enabling all the laptops, configuring them and getting everyone uh, comfortable with Microsoft team meetings and Zoom meetings. So this is just to say that how we can really, um, you know, start preparing for this. Of course, as we go along and we were very clear that we have to take each day as it comes because a new things were, was unfolding. But I must say one thing which I'm extremely proud about, the way our country has come together, the way our, our leaders have come together, keeping their political differences aside. I think it is so exemplary that I feel very, very proud about. And the way we all collectively as a country are dealing with this, of course, we'll all have some, someone stepping aside, you know, once in a while. But I think we all as a country have a lot to feel proud, proud about in terms of how we are dealing with this and coming together. And there are many, many examples that I can share with you uh, as we go along in terms of the responses that people have uh, done in this kind of a situation. Good point. Rajesh, would you want to, would you want to respond to this next? Yeah, thank you, Jan, and uh, I would, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now we can. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sujan. Uh, thanks so much, uh, I, I, would, I would concur with what Raju said. Uh, I think what we responded also was first for the cause of humanity. I think uh, no one prepares oneself for a mag you know, uh, an adversity of this kind of magnitude. So obviously, I think a lot of, lot of surprises did uh, crop up. But I think the first one, uh, from a leadership standpoint, was to really stand up to the cause of humanity. I think that confidence that one needed to express to say that, you know, we will sort this out uh, and we will, we will stand together and cohesively. Uh, don't worry about it. We're getting all the facts right. At that stage, mind you, I mean, none of us knew really, you know, which direction to go. We, we knew that the world has changed 90 degrees, but none of us knew in terms of you know how to respond to it so coming together in terms of a collective solidarity collective solidarity as far as the leadership was concerned so that this one single voice was very essential standing up to the cause of humanity was the second one so far as you know business continuity process and disaster recovery and all, all that but i think one we, we gathered uh, gathered a few things and put it together fortunately for us we have an integrated facility where all our you know uh, group companies in one single large facility where 20000 people work uh, there are other plants as well, but you know that place particularly. We have a good which we call essential services, and they geared to handle a lot of you know scale as far as magnitude is concerned. One of the reasons why I say that is because it's in the seismic zone. You know, it's a it's a seismic zone where we started everything after the entire touch was wiped off. So, mm -hmm. an adversity is something that we are used to in a in a in a different manner. I mean, not a biological one that we're seeing today. So some kind of preparedness was there, but by no means want to you know say that you know we were reasonably prepared. So it all came together, starting with the leadership, taking the communication to the last mile, saying that you know definitely reassuring people as far as their protection of employment was concerned, protection of the salary was concerned, ensuring that it will get rolled out. The first few days was all around humanity, getting people together, aligning ourselves, and putting our thoughts together and messaging across. I think that's exactly what we did. Yeah, in terms of preparedness, I would say I think we we were there at about forty percent. If you were to do a you know a complete mm -hmm. check of you know where we are, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's a real test uh, as to how we can build build on from here. And are there lessons learned for the next time? And we hope there's no next time. But are there lessons learned on hundred percent? Hundred percent on. Yeah. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, there are massive building blocks that's coming into place. A lot of institutionalizing. Is institutionalization is happening right now as we talk. I mean, plenty of processes are getting reinforced. Uh, I think this is a massive learning. I mean, uh, no, no one wishes that we see one more of this kind. Yes. But I guess the world has definitely changed 90 degrees. Uh, yes. And we all realize that work is just a small subset of life yes. and how important life is. I think that's the biggest realization and reflection. Yes. And we all realize that, you know, let's, let's work towards that. So yes. the social factors have become manifold and more important than the business side of the house. Yeah, yeah. 
So true. I'm going to turn this over to Milind. Milind, um, you know, uh, I said to you at the start of the webinar that we asked around saying, tell us about people who've managed this, um, you know, this crisis well. And we got more than one source saying, speak to Milind Apte of SEAT because they've done an incredible job. Tell us a bit about what you did. I mean, there would be great insights on best practices there. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Sujaya. So I think the, the first thing which was, uh, uh, which was important was to calm the nerves of our employees. So I think uh, we looked at employees. Uh, we looked at employee families because that's an uh, integral part of the ecosystem. And we looked at all the stakeholders who are also integral part of our ecosystem. So I think we decided to address this ecosystem very, very quickly. We thought cash flow and business crisis will come later. Uh, so first we went out. We told people that there's a crisis. Don't worry about it. We are confident we'll get you out of it. First, nobody will lose your job. Uh, you are part of our large family. We are with you. And we'll make sure we only prosper after this uh, end of crisis. So Anant Frentlid, uh, Anant, uh, our managing director and the owner, uh, did several conversations and communication. Another big thing we uh, did was we uh, have a chief fitness officer on board. And... What we quickly did is we connected with almost 1,000 families and we went right into their kitchen and we actually advised them on what to do and what not to do. So spouses, kids uh, who are having a lot of anxieties uh, with regard to what to eat, what not to eat, and a lot of scare around coronavirus. I think we managed to straight go inside the kitchen and kind of recommend a recipe which will build their uh, immune system. A lot of questions we received from the spouses, and uh, it was good to address those questions. I think that calmed the nerves quite a bit. Then we actually rolled out emergency advisory services, because what we realized is uh, doctors aren't easily available. And even if you go with a cold and flu uh, or cold and you are sneezing, you are straight referred to for a virus test. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we actually had our chief fitness officer responding to such panic calls 24 by 7. And the kind of calls we received and, you know, simple things, but we were able to address them. Uh, we went and hired a fitness trainer. So we got one of the best fitness trainers on board who fortunately had the capability of editing videos every day and put up a session. And we engaged close to 4,000 people uh, every day through exercise format in the morning. So 8.30 every morning, we threw a challenge, exercise challenge. And 8.30 to 9, people were engaged in a form of uh, exercise. And that's continuing. And that will continue definitely till 3rd of May. And uh, we had, obviously, counselors to manage anxiety, which people typically face uh, during such uh, circumstances. Uh, to add to all of this, we, uh, we have an initiative called Pulse. And the idea of this initiative is to build strong relationship with employees and their families. So actually, every manager reached out to five to seven employees and their families twice in a week to, to make sure that any anxiety is settled at uh, the grassroots level. So I think very, very broadly, Suja, uh, these are some of the initiatives. And yeah. apart from loads of communication, so believe me, communication, and uh, we are absolutely over-communicated, uh, especially on the security job loss part, but no job loss part. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you an add-on question there, especially because, you know, we have, um, you know, very dismaying examples of poor communication inside the organizations. So I'd like you to spend a little bit of time around this crisis communication. You said you over-communicated. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Because, I mean, I'm sure the audience would like to know what is the meaning of good crisis communication? What did your leaders really tell your people? Uh, so I think uh, uh, clearly we told them that this is a crisis where the entire world is suffering. So we, uh, this is not unique to us. So don't worry about it, right? We are in, uh, we are in this together. Uh, you have been a part and parcel of building what we are today uh, for years. Uh, so please do not worry about what will happen to you. So I think cut that risk first. Then we spoke about the methods and what we are doing as an organization to combat this crisis. We spoke clearly about uh, cutting down our expenses. We spoke about uh, picking the social cause over individual aspirations. And we appealed to people to actually uh, uh, work as a team in this crisis, right? So uh, to an extent where, uh, you know, some of our conversations before uh, the webinar today, uh, people who are not used to work from home, people who are production supervisors, 
what do they do at home but uh, we went to the extent of understanding their concerns through communication and actually providing them a workable solution and also a framework around what you can do through the day as you connect with all of us we spoke to kids we spoke to spouses we uh, counseled them on the uh, kind of challenge they may face in the relationship because all of them are together yes. so so the kind of patience the kind of maturity which is expected to be demonstrated so some kind of education also we tried to actually give um, managers made sure as i told you twice in a week i think managers made sure that the reach out is beyond business to solve any problem which the employee may be facing uh, on the ground and anand himself every 15 days came on a call and believe me if his brief was 15 minutes question and answers went on till 1 hour 1 and 1/2 hour and he addressed every question patiently uh, uh, let it be business let it be work from home or let it be job security i think all of this has helped us big time uh, we have got a number of responses from our employees uh, and very positive responses i would say so right. so very very broadly this is what we have done and we have never ever t- spoken about the crisis i think we have consistently uh, brought the point on board that we are in this together the entire world is suffering but our foundation is strong fundamentals are strong we'll come out of it don't don't worry about it so right so sujaya i would want to just um, yes one very different perspective and a different yes. experience here right? yes uh, as you all know that pharmaceuticals is part of the essential services yes but you know uh, let me just share with you the experiences that one goes through so when the lockdown was announced on 22nd march and for the first two or three days you know while all the administrative machinery was getting their act around to really understand what to do and how to manage and they were just being enforcing the lockdown very very seriously we had a different kind of a challenge we had a challenge where employees wanted to come to work but there was a fear of the police people in terms of you know getting beaten up uh, but you know i must say the people were very brave and they did step out of their house and while we were able to you know work with the government machinery to get all the curfew passes and all of that issued which yeah. take a couple of days our people did step out so the it's a very different kind of a challenge where you have to get people to step out of their house and come to work and we have a lot of superheroes and you know super women who've actually done that but what is very interesting which i want to share with you is that at this time people want to hear leaders talk and what they are wanted to do so what we did is we actually had a webinar where all the management council members got together we had the highest number of logins ever we had about 17000 people log in for this one and a half hour open chat people could ask any kind of questions and we had more than 1000 questions that people asked in that one and a half hour who so was answering these questions the entire management council so we are yeah. nine of us we were all there uh, including our ceo our chief manufacturing officer everyone was actually there to answer all their question including myself our cfo and people could ask anything and everything so were, it is very important to understand and be out there to to help them understand anything that they wanted to ask so that was that worked very well along with the all other communications that milan also had alluded to but it's important to communicate communicate so we have a communication plan and every day we have to communicate with our people that's super that's really really heartening to know i'm going to now turn over to akil and arun and vishali and my question is that uh, you know to these assurances on job security and the rest of that um less than 2 weeks into the lockdown we were already hearing about job losses left right and center there is um, a significant 136 million jobs estimated to be lost over this lockdown and over the covid-19 crisis uh, we now heard some very dismaying information just yesterday around um huge job losses in the media industry i just want to get your reactions to this our organizations not able to sustain even for two weeks uh, what exactly is going on these are all large organizations they all some of them have booked profits in the last financial year what what's really going on um you know is there a mechanism to be able to and i'm sure they have business compulsions but i'm just trying to understand from you your reactions to to seeing this kind of this kind of extent of job losses and that too so early in the um, so early into the lockdown i mean we've not even waited a month to be able to estimate whether we can or we can't akil do you want to go first that's the question there i think there's a question about job loss 
and assuring employment has uh, two angles to it, two edges actually. And having gone through dot com burst in 2008, uh, while it is very natural for us to uh, step forward and assure that there'll be no job losses, and I, I understand what Rajesh and Milin were mentioning, they meant it that way because they're that under control. But there are many medium sized and different organizations who have absolutely no idea about the affordability. So my view on on communication is be realistic. Do not try to sound very optimistic in sense there will be no job cut, there will be no salary cut, life will be as usual. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying this, because this particular crisis, nobody knows the end date, not even estimate. Now, your question that can, don't we have resilience in organizations to sustain for one month, two months? Of course we have. These are the short term decisions some organizations are taking advantage of the situation and making their books balance and show their right faces to the stakeholders. The point here is to plan for the midterm future. And I would look at it this way, that while we can guarantee salaries and jobs, say up to say two months or three months forward looking, which we should, and that is the buffer that every organization does have, small or big, and exactly what Rajesh and Milind have done. But suppose, God forbid, this was to carry on in future, I would start looking at one option that we guarantee something called subsistence earning, which would be about 60% of your earning. 40% would be kept in a deferred pay as, a, um, as an account to be taken in future when things improve. I think somewhere this will balance the business requirement as well as the employee. And before this call, Rajesh Padmanabhan was very rightly mentioned that we should not talk about employees and HR. But look at the business. So somewhere this subsistence earning, if that can be worked out and be openly transmitted and communicated to employees, that we will pay you enough to survive a little over, but not it's not going to be party time. So that angle. Second, from the idea of jobs, there are two very separate entities which we are actually forgetting. This is a time to maintain organization reputation. And it's not to be taken for granted. This is one of the time values and reputations to be protected. So April being the month when the fresh graduates from uh, management schools and engineering schools are entering the market, they are in doldrums as to what will happen to the career. Many organizations have said, oh, we'll see about that, we'll postpone. But if any organization is thinking that they will cancel offers to these young students and say, okay, times are bad, we can't help it, they will pay a price in future for not being an attractive employer. Short-term gains will give them long-term damages in future. And that is why somewhere a sensible approach to make sure that you have enough resilience within the organization to absorb shock of this type, not forever, but you cannot take shortcut to say times have changed, sorry, job cuts, and we'll not honor our appointments and offers made to young students. To the second Internally, I would say we should be more liberal, mm. opposite of what we are talking in this forum, to our people who are very critical for rebound. Right. We cannot afford to lose them. So that is where the money has to be uh, used sensibly. We must make sure that that particular category of people whom we identify very judiciously are kept with us because if without that, our rebound will be impossible. So we must not just say save costs now, right? but we have ability to rebound with the type of people that we have. And without them, we will not rebound despite all the team, dreaming and wishes. Right. I'm going to turn this over to Vishali Dongri. And, you know, she deals with, uh, as part of KPMG, human capital practice, uh, deals with various organizations who she's advising. Vishali, tell me. Um, you know, what is your advice to organizations? Are there creative ways to be able to reduce costs? Um, rather than early in the game have these knee-jerk reactions where you've already called out how many numbers you're going to uh, reduce. I'm sure you have people re uh, reaching out to you, asking you for solutions around this. Is there any advice you'd like to give the audiences on how to go about this? Uh, thanks, Sujaya. I think um, Akhil made a very pragmatic and excellent point um, the entire idea, I, I think I'll, what I'll do is 
uh, go a little bit to the big picture of what organizations are doing. Hmm. In my experience, different sectors are reacting to this very differently. Hmm. Like uh, the three uh, esteemed panelists we have, their sector is the major hit, yes. where employees need to be around and hmm. how uh, things are to be uh, controlled. Hmm. But there are uh, other sectors which can hmm. actually work from home, yes. which can operate with work, gig workforce, which can also operate with liquid workforce. So I'll, I'll just tell you what it means. Hmm. First of all, what organizations have done, they have taken a budget, in a, looked at the budget very differently. Hmm. So usually in April, you come up with a forecast and you create your new strategy. Mm. And right now, what organizations have done, mm. they've created strategies for three or four different scenarios. Mm. COVID highest impact, COVID midterm impact, and COVID long, uh, 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 very okay. less impact. And the fourth one is the forecast and uh, strategy for business as usual. Mm. Basis that the entire workforce planning is getting done. Hmm. And and there there is a, a you I mean softer aspect are brilliantly done by organization we never thought will be able to do but hmm. even the way we used to look at our strategic intent is completely changed hmm. now what organizations are doing and also asking us whether let's say some of these as, aspect hmm. can be business as usual hmm. what I mean is many of our workforce is working from home today hmm. can looking at a future operating model can it completely change and some of them can still work from home in hmm. long-term business as usual situation hmm. our organizations are also doing something very interesting that hmm. is that they're calling it something known as families of roles which are being created yes now it's not going to be the same workforce population which is going to enter your organization and that's going to be your future what is going to happen is what you can do is in a very practical manner mm -hmm. are your families of role going to be dis different cluster so mm -hmm. from all your operating model your organizational structure can there be some families of roles which could be only be working on site can there be a roles which can be only being working work from home? Can there be a hybrid model altogether? And can some of your work be outsourced completely to the gig workforce? So very interesting uh, things are emerging. And this is all being done to take care of the cost optimization. However much we say, the cost is central right now. And I think HR leaders are playing brilliant job to take care of the people concern. But even our business guys are thinking very creatively to come up with options, work with HR leaders, and come up with a very different operating model, come right. up with a workforce which is going to be a liquid workforce. Uh, in a simple manner, what is a liquid workforce? I'm an HR, but I am in the pool of liquid workforce. Tomorrow, if need be, I can work in the marketing area. So there is a common network of work which I, I can interchangeably use so yeah. that there is no crisis if the situation comes and we have to manage certain things. There yeah. will be uh, cer certain situations which can be taken care of. Right. I think one last thing I will, I will consultants talk a lot, but I'll very quickly uh -huh. say one thing. Yes. Culture. Hmm. Where the way we need to build our culture going forward is going to be very critical. And people yes. have started reflecting on it. People have started working on it. People are yes. making the shift. Competencies, capabilities are changing. Yes. And tomorrow, how you are going to do a performance management system, you'll hmm. be surprised it's going to be very different. Right. The KPIs, right. KRAs, the productivity, everything is going to be different I'm, yes. I'm sounding as if this is going to be very long term but we don't know till when yes. it will continue right so i'll right. pause here yeah. 
Yes. Okay. So, you know, I want you to not go away without me asking you this question because I had saved it for you at the end. But I'm going to ask that right now because you brought in work from home and, uh, you know, workforce planning so significantly into the conversation. So I want to ask you, what's your own estimate? Do you believe with the way in which you're seeing your clients and other organizations react? Would you agree that work from home is here to stay? Uh, yes. I. Sorry, is, is this for Arun or is, is it? No, it's for you. It's for you. I'm okay. just asking, would you agree if I, when I say that work from home is here to stay in the sense that, you know, very significant part of work, most organizations are considering or reconsidering now that they've experienced this, yes. which is like you're rightly pointing out, which jobs really require to be able to get done uh, internally, which ones can be done uh, at home try and look at how it is that you can look at job families and find fluid yes. workforces. So I'm just trying to figure from you, what is your estimate? Most organizations are going to change the way they work into the future, especially yes. in the context of work from home. Yeah. So, uh, so Jaya, very quick point, uh, work from home for certain unique roles are absolutely possible. Hmm. And for certain industry, uh, uh, not so much for manufacturing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for many, many others, it is very clearly possible. Hmm. We need to have our infrastructure built to support this work from home if we want to keep it as business as usual. Right, right. Thank you, uh, Vishali. I'm going to turn the part that Vishali ended with back to Arun at this point. Arun, uh, Vishali touches upon a point yes. that I've sent you forward, that these are such, a, such great times to redefine your culture. So will you come in at this point to be able to tell us what can, how can organizations um, introspect, uh, you know, use this time to introspect, use this time sure. to reinvent. And even if we'd ended up creating some kinds of organizations, is this giving us the much needed and much required opportunity to reinvent ourselves? Absolutely. So Jaya, I think uh, you, you nailed it. It is a great opportunity for HR leaders, business leaders to rethink the whole purpose of business, the whole purpose of work. And I go back to what Rajesh said. Uh, it is really about life. It's not as if life is for business. It is really that business is for life. Work is for thriving life. So I think it's, we are in a transition where from toxic work patterns, from a from, uh, lot of stress and a lot of fragmentation, we are now slowly seeing the blibbering of a new culture, a new way of looking at business. So I think it's great time for HR leaders and others to reinvent business. Now, what does that mean specifically? I think it means, number one, a, a lot more focus on the kind of work that Vashali said. It's no longer going to be, you know, set roles and set boundaries and set things, but work which is a lot more flexible, a lot more gig economy kind of thing, a lot more focus on what is the value that I'm creating, not how much time have I put in, how much money am I earning, but how much value am I creating for myself and my customers. And I think this will require a lot of re-education of the people who are losing jobs. Right. Can we help them to redefine work? Can we help them to find what gives them joy? Can we help them find their ikigai, their most joyful work and yes. facilitate their building a career, a second innings around that? Right. Even people who are coming out of colleges, I mean, it's not just going into a cushy job and earning a salary. The question we have to ask them is, what is the value you're creating? And the moment we ask, what is the value you're creating? We have to talk about values. We have to talk about purpose. We have to talk about what is the purpose of life. And we can never find meaning and purpose unless we're doing something outside of ourselves. Unless right. we're thinking in terms of service. Which right. means, again, just like we are thinking about customers, just like any business thinks about its customers, can we HR leaders really think about I think we seem to have lost uh, Arun's voice for a bit. Sorry, I, I think, uh, can you hear me I now? Think we'll just go 30 seconds back and repeat what you said because we lost you for uh, a bit. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying the beautiful examples that Milind, Rajesh and Raju gave us yes. are examples of deep compassion and empathy for people. Yes. And I think every single person, whether it is a business leader or an HR leader or anyone has to have that sort of compassion. 
And right. I think one very, very important thing I'd like to quote uh, Dr. T.V. Rao uh, a few days back. He said, it is time for HR leaders to take leadership and show the way towards a more sustainable, spiritually fulfilling and socially just way, way of leading and living. Right. So Jaya, this is the time to make that happen. Right. And one big change that's happening in the culture and is getting fostered by what we are seeing is yes. coming out of silos. Huge yes. amount of collaboration, huge amount of bonding. Very quick example in Pune, we're doing some work for relief operations for people you know, who, who don't have food. Hmm. 25 NGOs, 67 activists are all collaborating on WhatsApp to find where NGO are, where we are, it's just seva, seva, seva. So I think this is an opportunity for huge shifts. And I think the shifts are from silo and waste to war on waste, from competing with each other to completing each other, and from money, money, money to value, value, value. What's the value? Yeah, good stop. point. Good point. Thank, Thank you. you. I think at this point, I want to check with uh, Sunit. Do we have TV Rao in the audience? Yes, we do. Yeah, can we can we try and bring him in? So I think this is, um, you know, very opportune to have TV Rao with us on this webinar. So I'm going to try and bring uh, Dr. Rao in. Uh, can we unmute Dr. Rao? Yeah, Dr. Rao, this is. Uh, can we have his video on as well, sir? Do you want to put your video on? I'm sure the audience would be delighted to be able to have you on this webinar. Hi. Well, I'm. I'm yes. enjoying uh, listening to each one of them. I am uh -huh. very impressed with the concept which uh, uh, Vaishali talked about liquid. Uh, uh, uh -huh. So I, it gave me the concept that I think in future we, there should be a lot more versatile managers. Yes. I'm totally in uh, uh, sync with uh, what uh, uh, Arun has said. Yes. I think this is, this is the time entire approach uh, I think most organizations, mm -hmm. every organization is meant to serve people. Yes. Somewhere down the line, they have forgotten the main objective means, which is the profit uh, has become the end in itself. And that is where I think we have faltered. And I think COVID-19 has brought back to surface the yes. need for uh, revisiting uh, the main purpose for which every organization, every single organization is meant for people. Right. I would say people first. I mean, that is the way I look at it. So yes. there is no alternative and that is where HR has a phenomenal role to play. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, TV. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Thank sir. You Thank comments. you for coming in and, and adding to the conversation in such a brilliant way. Thank you. So I think with that, uh, you know, I want to be able to include some of the comments that we are seeing in the chat box so we don't lose sight of that. There are also some questions here which we will look at. Um, you know, I think there is a question around work from home. I'm going to try and direct this one to uh, Raju, Rajesh, uh, Milind. Uh, Shashank Srivastav is asking, work from home, which is a new technique that came into existence unexpectedly and by chance, but looking towards its success in the industry, can it, be, can it be obtained or can it be ascertained as a general policy by companies even after COVID-19? pandemic gets over, what can be the advantages or disadvantages of being able to make this something that is part of the working policy within organizations? Rajesh, you would like to take that? Part? Rajesh, do you want to respond to that? Thanks, Sujiya. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I'll be brief uh, just, to, just to ensure that everybody has the air time. Um, it's here to stay, undoubtedly here to stay. But the real, real classic tussle is, you know, it works very well in the service industry, uh, but in the manufacturing and the real industry where you, you need to uh, have a lot of machine interface, it does cause issues. But that does not mean that you cannot do, you know, a few things away from that. Uh, but work from home is going to definitely alter the way at least leadership uh, uh, bandwidth is concerned, decision making, and most importantly, I must admit with complete confession that it has broken a huge myth and the mindset that we all need to be physically out there and seeing each other do the meetings and take decisions. I think this platform of you know really connecting from home has brought in a lot of efficiency 
this mindset which is classically a leadership mindset has got broken so it's it was never never an issue that 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 was that was uh, actually the issues were always there the requests were always there why not more telecommuting why not more work from home but i think it was more of a leadership mindset which has actually gone into a confession where people have you know begin to admit it's here to stay for sure but the challenges of the real world do not get addressed uh, completely yeah but i think a huge part of learning training skilling will move to digital so that part will actually ensure uh, even in the real world so that particular tenant is going to be strong there i leave it at this i'm sure there are further bills that will come from the others yes so i'm going to at this point just throw this open to anyone in the panel um you know this is such a this has been such an incredible time to be able to um you know demonstrate and spot resilience and um, you know resilience is going to be you know such a central theme for what we call leadership or leadership behavior going forward i'm just interested to know um you know what are the ideas that are coming to your own mind on how leadership attributes have shifted if at all during this phase i mean what are we now focusing on more within organizations uh, you know what are the you know you know what are the ideas already emerging in terms of finding your future leaders or your high potential people at a time like this what are you spotting what are you looking for uh, you know i mean if we are out of the crisis mode we can start thinking more uh, sort of constructively and creatively around uh, developing the organization and working during the recovery phase i'm just trying to figure out are there ideas emerging already yeah. around this which is what constitutes leadership now yeah so so jay one of the things that we are seeing is that in such crises the capacity to remain calm to remain positive to remain centered in deep faith in yourself and in your people and in life is an extremely important quality for all leaders to have and that we have found comes from the capacity to take pauses the capacity to be silent and so what we are recommending to all the leaders we work with is take time to be still take time to be silent because even when the mind cannot find the answers what i have seen is when you're still when you're just silent and you're surrendered to life as a whole Yes. you suddenly find intuitive answers you find guidance and when a collective a group of people sit together in silence together as one unit who are surrendered to life miracles happen so yes. i think i would say the capacity to reclaim the power within ourselves yes. capacity to connect with that and be that is the most important quality for leaders which will help clarity conviction courage and resilience Super. Yeah. Okay. You wanted to add to this. I think, like the way Arun mentioned it, that is the time to take a look back. Uh, I feel this is a time for leaders not to be leaders. This is a time to actually delegate leadership responsibilities to a bunch of competent people and trust them. Make small task force, and I'm being very pragmatic and very practical at the grassroots level. make small task force break chunks of big problem into small chunks let those task force work up upon them come up with practical ideas and implementation and maybe execute and leaders need to just be there as backup as a safety net stop being leaders all the time <clears throat> all right you're saying it's the end of the heroic leader we've come to the era of the end of the heroic because you have extra stars on your shoulders yeah. here doesn't mean you yeah. feel that you must lead all the time yeah. this is the time to encourage a second layer of leaders because what will happen two things one you will instill confidence that we can do it and the good point that milin and rajesh mentioned so eloquently about building that rapport and going to reach people and over communi- and milin i don't agree that there is anything like over communication sir you are doing a great job of communicating now this type of approach of a task force which leaders supervise and mentor will have two major impact one involvement of people trust and involvement second they have a purpose and what arun and dr t v now were mentioning if i live for something i have hope if i'm just living for that stupid paycheck whether it will come or not i will lose hope every 27th of the month mm-hmm. we got to come out of theory and make sure that people live for something now okay that is they come but this is the time for leaders to make sure that people feel i'm doing something and i like the way arun put it 
you got to and you know this talk on purpose and all that was very theoretical all this time i personally feel this is the time to practice it and what an opportunity yes so there are people that you have something to do my friend you may yes. be three stars less than me but you are as important come and join me yes so you just yes. must step back yes absolutely Uh, Rajesh, can we have your view? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to be very mindful of time. I'm just going to build it in one minute. Let me see yes. if I can do it. Uh, individual success. I think we've been banking on four. Imagine a flower uh, mm. with four petals and a stem. Mm. Mm. Yeah. We've been always talking about skill, mm. will, mm. culture, and performance, mm. which actually drives individual success. Going on from here, I would put the stem as transformation. It's mm. not change management anymore. Hmm. Yeah, transformation. Sorry, I'll repeat. He's asking you to repeat I'll... four four petals of the flower. Yeah. Yeah. Skill. Skill. Yeah. Well, performance yeah. and culture. Hmm. This COVID nineteen taught us to build the stem the transformation, where we each of them we are building hard skills, mind you, because skills we are hard skills we are building. you building resilience tenacity and all that all those come under the will category we are ensuring that performance is at, at at a peak in terms of a situation like this we are also ensuring that there are cultural tenets which are undergoing a change we are redefining the fabric of the entire workplace that being true the the, the transformation that capability that we are building right now mm. is the innovation it's here to stay mm. if we can institutionalize this into capability building model i think is all set out for future success so i think the the stem and the flower is what i would give as the simplest uh, you know uh, virtual demonstration of how yeah. you can develop the yeah nice analogy thank you for that um you know i think i'm going to at this stage um, you know ask you a question around uh, health employee wellness and health and what is the work uh, you know you believe organizations should be doing in the space at this time for the <laughs> hr who are on this um, a panel discussion what indeed do you think you know has worked in the context of your own organization and i'm talking about fear anxiety related to what's going to come up in the future what just happened how everyone's vulnerable to this you don't know when it is going to be you next um so in the in the midst of a global pandemic what is the responsibility organizations have towards employee health and i'm interested to ask this because we are not hearing of very great uh, focus or practices in this space and i'm saying if we paid lip service to this all along and we've not done too much in this space then this is the time and i'm saying that best organizations say we have yoga classes or that we do uh, we get our people to be able to meditate um and uh, we have zumba classes and i'm just saying i'm not talking about that i'm just saying really taking health as a very significant risk and working around that um within organizations and having some very visible contribution towards employee health so just interested to know your views on this yeah yeah i would like to go on this and then i'll drop off the call because i have another call at 5 yes. so just a couple of things that i want to say you know these are moments when people want to talk to somebody and they want somebody to listen to and yes it can be their immediate manager it can be their immediate supervisor so the very simple thing that we can do is to open up channels of communication with each and every one and i think this gives a lot of, lot of comfort to the people so this is a simple and it doesn't uh, the other thing is that a lot of times people also need professional help because not everyone can hand, handle the anxiety so i think giving the uh, this to some talking to psychologists or people you know who are counselors or has also really proven to be very very helpful at least in our situation that people can actually talk about and uh, you know uh, and we all discussed rajesh and milan and arun everyone referred and akhil also in terms of what is it that will really get people to be because it's a new normal for most of people we are staying at home we don't know how to deal with this new normal of life uh, so a lot of counseling is required even in the families how to manage their time how to balance the priorities both for if two spouses were working how do they do it so i think getting open up these channels of communication and being available at least in our case has helped us a lot right we remain open and be communicative and uh, and have a individual orientation towards health all right milind what would you like to add to that uh, i think clearly uh, to my mind uh, uh, mental health uh, will play a very very important role here 
and how do we bring in optimism so a lot of work needs to be done on the mental framework um uh, dr tal ben sir's work he speaks about energy management and ikigai as arun was referring to also uh, speaks about the entire energy which you get so i would feel when you look at health uh, of employees a how do you make people more optimistic so a lot of work needs to be done on looking at the brighter side of life right. and uh, completely staying away from this negativity and uh, something which will end our lives and our jobs etc uh, i think that's one part second uh, obviously i would genuinely feel uh, physical health will continue to play a very important role so any right. format which a company can afford uh, i think we should continue to invest in people's physical health uh, work from home i think on one side looks very bright but it has its own impact on the health of the employees also because right. you're practically not getting up uh, from your place for hours together right i would go a step further i think it's not only the employee health i would actually bring holistic focus on the family and yes. the health of entire family because i think it is this ecosystem which is going to generate a lot of energy and positivity uh, uh, for the employee so right Right. Yeah, so you Susan, can I just yes. uh, take thirty yes. seconds? I think yes. you know, what we found is that a simple change in diet, yes. a simple change in breathing, and just dropping sugar yes. has remarkable impacts on the energy and well-being of people. Absolutely. And I think we need to educate people and their families about this. You know, stopping yes. processed food, yes. uh, having more greens, uh, just yes. having more moringa leaves. Very few people yes. know yes. that the drumstick leaves are the world's most powerful food but very few people know this yeah you know so simple yeah. things like this can make a huge difference sure okay you wanted to make a point i go by you know during the uh, holy crisis in motorola.com it's a very severe crisis we realized that our employee assistance program clocked in something like 46 to 47% increase use most of us and uh, many organizations here are not even aware or prepared to provide professional counseling that uh, somebody was mentioning just now that you know there must be a phone call away confidential where people can talk about their anxiety and issues uh, because suicidal tendencies and uh, depression etc are very common uh, outcome of such a crisis now physical health of course is important but not many people <clears throat> would uh, would Uh, think of about the mental peace and the counseling now maybe a forum like ours can actually refer some people without any obligation or uh, liability and form counselors group who can then be available to industry we just right? did that okay we had a we had a webinar on uh, mental health day before yesterday and we've offered uh, pro bono uh, mental health services to everyone who was on that webinar whoever registered on the webinar and so like to that, yeah yeah we partnered we partnered with someone called inner hour and we've offered it to everybody who was on the webinar and you know we're happy to extend it to you as well everyone who's on this webinar to be able to offer you uh, lnod round table has associated with inner hour to be able to offer mental health services uh, to its members so we're happy to be able to extend it to anyone who's on this webinar as well in fact i wanted to take this opportunity to be able to talk about you know the way in which everyone's going to now experience the next wave of covid-19 and we don't know increasingly perhaps uh, going by the trend in other countries who've been ahead on the curve uh, as compared to us that you suddenly have more and more people you know who actually um, get the uh, covid-19 and i wanted to be able to call out an advisory uh, which comes which came in from world health organization which is around mental health and i want to be able to just um, ask you to indulge me and i know we've exceeded 5 o'clock we're almost at 5:5 um so quick check with everyone we are continuing because we started late so we'll try and, and close this in the next hopefully 5 to 7 minutes but i want you to stay with me as i read the advisory of the world health organization and this is only to be able to point out that there are a few things we still need to be prepared for as a community around mental health um so just stay with me as i read this and it says covid-19 has and is likely to affect people from many countries in many geographical locations when referring to people with covid-19 do not attach the disease to any particular ethnicity or nationality be empathetic to all those who are affected in and from any country people who are affected by covid-19 have not done anything wrong and they deserve our support compassion and kindness 
And the second point says, do not refer to people with the disease as COVID-19 cases, victims, or COVID-19 families, or the diseased. They are people who have COVID-19, people who are being treated for COVID-19, or better still, people who are recovering from COVID-19. And I like the third one, really, to be able to refer to people who get COVID-19 as people who are recovering from COVID-19. And I point this out because I think we still have a lot of work to do as a society on the sheer stigma attached to people who are already suffering. And, you know, now increasingly in our vicinity, we'll know more people who have this. And it's important to know how we're going to treat people who have this because um, there are societies who don't want people who have COVID-19. There are the, there are families um, you know, who have a stigma because somebody in their family was found to have COVID-19. It's very important that we create a vocabulary around this, which is respectful. And um, so the World Health Organization says people who have COVID-19 are people who have COVID-19 or people who are being treated for COVID-19 or people who are recovering from COVID-19. And after recovering from COVID-19, their life will go on with their jobs, families and loved ones. It is important to separate a person from having an identity defined by COVID-19 in order to reduce the stigma. So I've just taken the opportunity to plug this in. Uh, we did bring this up during our mental health webinar, but I think it's ever so important to be prepared as a society, especially around issues of stigma and alienation. This will just become one more reason of div divide, dividing and fragmenting rather than joining and collaborating like Arun was pointing out. So I think with that, uh, I know we've exceeded time. I just want to be able to bring in Ajay Venkatesh. I think he's been very active on the chat and he also had a question. So if you can, um, Sunit, bring in Ajay Venkatesh. Ajay, you had a question around, are there creative solutions organizations can have around reducing manpower costs? So can, I, can we bring Ajay Venkatesh in, please? Sunit, is Ajay still there? Yes, I'm just bringing him on. All right, okay, great stuff. Hi, Ajay. All right, for the benefit of everyone uh, who may not know him, Ajay Venkatesh is part of KPMG. Uh, you know, he's been very instrumental with the survey that we've sent out to all of you. And I think he's had a couple of questions. So Ajay, I'm going to hand this over to you to be able to ask the question directly to whichever panelist you want to direct this to. Ajay, are you there? Okay, I'm going to ask the question on his behalf. What will be the top two cultural changes you would want to drive in your organizations going forward? May I respond? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Please do. Okay, Suja, I think one of the things that uh, one of the two would be a spirit of value innovation. And let me explain what I mean. You know, really inquiring from customers and employees what is of value to them and then finding ways to serve that. And you'll find that sometimes you can enhance value and reduce the cost at the same time. Now, this is needed on the customer facing end and on the employee facing end. Yes. And I think once we have a framework of value innovation, we say, what's the value to you? What can we reduce, do, and, and innovate around that? We'll reduce cost, enhance value, both for customers and for employees. Yes. So this is one change. The second one, I would say, is a huge amount on positivity, on mindfulness, yes. on being anchored in faith, and learning the culture of silence, and being in tune with life. I think these two things will transform the inner and the outer work of, of all our work. Right. Akil, you had something to say here. I would say that this will, be, this will lead to a strong culture of alignment. Right. One being external, which Arun just referred, that am I adding value or am I just giving service and product? And something we have to re-introspect as to what is considered value. Hmm. So that is external. The internal part, and especially for the HR community, is we must and we will have to willy-nilly redefine why we are there. It is not to provide a service. And the alignment with the line managers and the business and the end result of the business should and will come in big, big way to HR community. It's no more just going to be having some 
chatbots and uh, you know be very nice about having technology and um, I, I know I'm being critical of HR, but as a part of the HR community, I can afford to do that. I think we'll have to learn, and the two cultural change will happen that those, those who don't align will yes. not survive. Will right. not survive. Yes. So we we we'll have to understand that we've got to align within the organization with the purpose of the organization and make people's solution as a contribution and align with the outside world for sustenance of the organization itself. So I would I put only one word to the future culture. If you're not aligned, you will be dinosaurs. Right, right. Um, Rajesh, do you want to take this? Yes, you know, what two cultural changes would you want to drive within your own office? Yeah, so there are four levers that we, we attribute as our culture, which is customer centricity, inclusive growth, technology, and collaboration. I'll take the customer centricity part of it and technology and blow it up a bit more. Hmm. On the customer centricity part of it, what we realize right now is we're not going to do things for the customer or going to do things along with the customer. Hmm. Here is an opportunity for us to think ahead of the customer because nobody is clear of the evolving world. When the world is so blurred, can hmm. you start thinking ahead of the customer and lead to a solution? So that's one right. cultural change that right. we're going to lead. Right. The second one is all of us have been talking about tech, but, you know, classically this digital game that we all are exposed to in the last decade or so, which is really getting intensified. Right. The tech part of it is, you know, all along tech has always been something which has been enabling business. Right. Now the, now the horse is ahead of the cart. Digital is yeah. going to lead business from here on. I think those two tenets are the big one. Yeah. And the third one, which actually brings it into the leadership fold, is all about leadership also needs to know how to skill themselves. It's mm. not just leadership development anymore. Yeah. They need to build some amount of hard skills. Yeah. Yes. And, and this digital and tech world of today, uh, combined with the adversities that we're facing, they need to skill, reskill themselves rather yes. than talking about skilling the entire organization. Right. I think I'll leave, right. I'll leave you with that. Yeah, that's, they're good points, great points. Um, Milin, any, any final words that you want to say before we close out the webinar? No, I think uh, quickly on culture, uh, uh, overused and abused word of empowerment. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we all feel we empower uh, as leadership team, we feel we empower. But yeah. in all surveys, we actually get feedback that we don't empower. So yeah. maybe it's a great opportunity. Work from home accidentally has thrown this opportunity to us. So I think this shift where we start trusting people, we give autonomy and we finally live up to the word empowerment. I think yeah. that's something which will, uh, to my mind, become priority. Yes. Second relationship, because as you go distance and you are not face to face, there is a shift which I see which happens from professional relationship through work driven through personal relationship because yeah. you are going away. You are not face to face anymore. Yeah. Yeah. How do you start building strong bonds with your employees? And third, guided conversation, I think as a culture, uh, because you will need in absence of many employees not coming face to face, can you actually build culture of conversations and which are guided? Good points. Great points. So clearly, I think what we're getting on culture is that the command and control styles is passe. Uh, you can't pay lip service to empowerment anymore. You've got to get into the trenches with the people and work together. I didn't hear very much about societal contributions and whether that's going to be a significant part of um, how it is that we want to be seen, we want to be positioned, how we want our employees to be able to see us. But I think this has been such a fabulous conversation. Thank you very much, Rajesh Padmanabhan of Wellspun, Akil Basrai of Akil Basrai um, uh, Consulting, uh, Arun Vaklu of Pragati, and uh, Melinda Apte of Siat. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you to Raju Mistri. She had to drop off uh, of Sipla, who's doing again very incredible work, Vishali Dongri of KPMG, uh, who's also been just ever so outstanding. Thank you everyone for being on this um, uh, webinar. We really enjoyed the um, some of the conversations which are in the uh, in the chats. I think they're addressed to some of you here. So if you do have the chance to uh, spend some time responding to that, this is a wonderful audience, very active in terms of all the comments here. We tried taking as many questions as we could. Um, you know, we'll try and make sure that the remaining get answered offline if they're required. But quick two uh, announcements for everyone. The HR response team of the LNOD Roundtable, should you need any expert advice pro bono, reach out to us. We're happy to be able to help you. Those of you who believe you need for yourselves or people in your family or in your teams, you need mental health support pro bono all through the lockdown. We've tied up with Inner Art to be able to organize that for you. And last but not the least, I want to be able to make a point on the KPMG 
survey that we partnered on on HR best practices. Please participate, including the panelists. Please contribute and participate so that um, you know we have a rich amount of data that KPMG is able to convert into a best practices survey report, which they will make available uh, to everyone. Uh, you would have the link now sitting in your inboxes. Um, so use the next 20 minutes and do the community a favor by contributing your ideas and your practices to everyone so that they can access this for their own organizations. Uh, if you participate, you're now entitled, you will then be entitled to by the 23rd of this month to a, uh, to a best HR practices report from 150 organizations. Um, so please participate and learn uh, and contribute to the learning of others. Thank you, everyone. This has been very insightful, wonderful panelists. Thank you again.